everyone. I'm Sharon Guinup. I'm a writer and researcher um, who covers wildlife ecosystems and environmental issues for numerous publications. I also am a National Geographic Explorer and a global fellow at the Wilson Center, uh, which is based in Washington, DC. Um, I'm gonna let Steve start off our talk today, so I'm gonna pass it to him. Okay, Steve. hi everybody, I'm Steve Winter. I've been a photographer at National Geographic for the past 25 years. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the power of photography, which is very important. I'm a wildlife photojournalist, but a lot of my life really changed when I started working uh, in wildlife photojournalism for National Geographic, because I found out that beautiful images are not all we need to tell a story. I need to have behavior, threats, the conservation of a species, but really tell the story of that species. So then you become a photojournalism for wildlife, but it's all about creating change. And I learned this on my first story for National Geographic on big cats. I found that National Geographic had never done a story on the jaguar, the world's third largest cat. And when I finally got to a point where I could actually see these cats, I found that I put, had to put my photojournalism hat back on and tell their story. Because I got down to the world's largest inland wetland in the Pantanal in Western Brazil and found out that amongst all these ranches, all the cowboys I met, their desire and their thinking was the only good jaguar was a dead jaguar. And I wanted to find out why. And they said, well, you know, we figure all our dead cows are the fault of jaguars. I thought this was absolutely incredibly wrong and couldn't be scientifically correct. And the scientist I was working with, her boss happened to be a very good friend of mine, Dr. Alan Rabinowitz. And I told Alan, hey, this is a perfect situation to do a project. I'm working well on the ranch of the former mayor of Rio. Anybody that would understand science would be right here. So you should do the uh, first ever GPS sat college study of these cats and to find out what's really going on. And a lot of people have asked me, well, why would you want to do this? And it's because, well, why would you spend two years working on a cat only to see them die? So the scientific project started. By the time it ended, we found, or Sandra Kawakanchi found, only 1% of cattle deaths could be attributed to jaguars. And I'll never forget the brother of the former mayor of Rio um, said to me, the first time he ever spoke English to me, though he was a businessman, one of the biggest in all of Brazil, spoke uh, English to me, said, this is the kind of science we can actually use. Thank you very much. We've been waiting a long time for this. Now, I got a couple pictures in that first story from the Pantanal. And when I went back nine years later, I found out that those two pictures created change down there. And a lot of these cattle ranches became ecotourism lodges because you could make more money on people coming to see jaguars and birds and all the other species in this extremely unique ecosystem very important word we're going to come back to, uh, then you could cattle ranching. And then two years ago, a study was just done that found that of all the jaguars in this core area of ecotourism, it's about, I don't know, maybe around 60 to 70 jaguars. Each one brings in $108,000 every year in ecotourism income. So not one, none of these ranchers are gonna harm a hair on the head of any of these jaguars. So I'd like to interject okay. and say that um, those images, you know, changed the situation for, you know, jaguars in that part of Brazil. And I think that was a real light bulb moment for you. you I know, know when, I was just when, gonna when say you, that. When you realized that, um, you know, the power of images um, is vast. It, it, you know, 
picture worth a thousand words and all that. Well, you're the photographer, I'm the writer. <laughs> no, you, in many instances, you're a better photographer than I am. <laughs> but to me, it was a light bulb moment. That's a great way to say it. But the other thing was that it taught me that big cats and other large species are vital to the health of any ecosystem. You know, if you save the top predator in any ecosystem, you save all life below it, kind of like an umbrella. So the health of the ecosystem is vitally important. None of these large predators have any other predators except us as humans. The health of, the health of an ecosystem is very important. I always say, think about it like your body. If, our, if we have a problem with one of our organs, our bodies don't function properly, and the same is with an ecosystem. The health of people, animals, and the ecosystem are linked. And with that thought, I want to give it over to Sharon. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to talk a bit about um, what's happening in the world right now. Um, and I've, I've kind of written up, and I'd like to you know, read, um, read part of it. Um, you know, the basic premise that I want to talk about for a, a while here is the fact that the current pandemic has brought our relationship with wildlife and nature into sharp focus and along with it, the renewed realization that human health relies on the health of the planet. Um, so, you know, with, with COVID-19, um, which is believed to have um, emerged from a seafood and wildlife market in Wuhan, China. Again, it's focused um, our attention on wildlife trafficking. I think it's really an important moment for us to recognize, you know, what the global trade in wildlife is, is doing. Um, this pandemic has led to renewed calls from the global community for an outright ban on the consumption of wild animals. And it's also placed China's, China's wildlife trade policies under intense international scrutiny. Um, but since wildlife trade is a global issue, it's gonna require a global effort to tackle. Countries must develop and adopt multi-pronged approaches that include strengthening policy and enforcement at national levels and raising public awareness promoting community involvement and changing consumer behavior. Um, you know, it's enough of a concern that um, illegal trade in wildlife has gained increasing attention from key UN agencies and international enforcement entities, including Interpol. And an effective you know, fight against wildlife trafficking is gonna require their continued effort and a global effort. Um, and part of that, um, also requires every country that has signed the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, species CITES, um, 183 nations globally, to honor their commitments to um, protect against illegal wildlife trade. And that means strong laws and strong enforcement. Um, so, you know, with that, I'm gonna, you know, pass back to Steve and, and um, I think he would like to talk a little bit more about um, the way that journalism can educate people and um, and make a difference. So, uh, so back to you, Steve. Okie dokie. Thanks, Daryl. Um, one of the stories that I did uh, happened to be another first, the first ever mountain lion, cougar, puma story. So as I was working on this story, I was working in wild areas, the Teton Cougar Project, and that was incredible. But part of what I wanted to do was work in urban areas, because I'd heard about places that, where they were seeing cougars coming into the edge of town, like Boulder, Colorado, Ashland, Oregon, the Bay Area, and even LA. Because one of the guys I was working with, Howard Quigley said, you need to go to LA because they have a bunch of cats that are collared in the largest urban park in the United States, the um, Santa Monica Mountain National Recreation Area. And they said they have a cat that walks through Cher's backyard and goes into the area around uh, Sunset Boulevard. 
So I needed to find more information. So I went to a mountain lion meeting in Bozeman, Montana to meet one man, the man that captures and collars these cats, to ask him, do you have any cats that walk on trails where you could see the lights of LA? And I asked him that question and he goes, no. And he didn't say anything more. And I went, well, how about the trail above Malibu? I know there's a trail there. Is, are there any cats walking there where you can see the lights of Santa Monica and, and the cities in the distance? And he, same thing, no. And I said, well, I'm going to come out and see you. So I went out, found out what he was talking about, and he was right. There, there wasn't any way you could see that. So I gave him all my information and said, let me know if anything changes. Because I said, you know what we really need to tell this story would be if we could get a mountain lion with a Hollywood sign. Now, as a scientist, he looked at me like I was completely crazy because scientists believe in what is and not what may be in the future in the crazy mind of a photographer. But, you know, I gave me information, left. Eight months later, I got a text that said, call me now. And I called him up and he says, you're not gonna believe this, but we have a mountain lion in Griffith Park, where the Hollywood sign is. So now my job started about how do you put cameras in downtown LA without them getting stolen. And it took me 15 months. After 11 months, I got a picture, the, that first picture of a mountain lion with all the lights of LA in the background. One day they put it on the cover of the LA Times to advertise the 125th anniversary show of National Geographic. And a con con conversation started. A lot of people first were like, hey, I walk my dogs in Griffith Park. Is that cat going to cause me trouble? And the scientist Jeff Sickich got on every local TV channel and told everybody, don't worry about it. A few months later, and after 15 months, I got the picture of the mountain lion under the Hollywood sign and things changed. And this really showed the power of photography. All of a sudden people were very interested in the fact that the greater LA area has animals. If you are in LA and look to the north, you see all these mountains. In those mountains are a lot of different species of animals. There's quite a few mountain lions in the Santa Monica's. Um, and uh, the, they, the cat made its way all the way to Griffith Park. Now, what happened was the Greater LA School District started talking about wildlife corridors in, in schools. And, and urban wildlife. Right, and urban wildlife. The Natural History Museum start, has an exhibit. The number one exhibit is about this cat called P-22, the Hollywood Cougar. Number one exhibit in the whole place, which is part of the La Brea Tar Pits. And now the state of California has approved it with all these other groups involved, the National Wildlife Federation, many, many more. They are going to build the world's largest wildlife overpass 12 miles north of LA. That's the power of photography. One other thing I did not too long ago was work with African parks. I've always said people need to benefit from living with animals. African Parks is to me like the, one of the best NGOs, if not the best working in Africa. They take parks that are denuded of wildlife. Everything's been poached out of it. They bring the animals back in. And most people would say, well, why are you gonna do that if they're just poached out? Because you're engaging the local population, giving them jobs. The women and men of the surrounding communities become the forest guards of the area. They work within the park. And so economically, they're tied right into the health of those animals, the health of the ecosystem, the success of that park, and the tourists that come to see it. And then the real kicker is, African Parks then brings in schools. What do we want more than anything for our kids is a great education, a greater opportunity. So yes, you know? they, they not only establish new schools, but right. then they also bring in health care, which is often right. not available. So just absolutely you know, there's just incredible. so many ways that, that life 
um, improves, you know, for local people, you know, economically, educationally, you know, health, and, and this model has worked in parks across Africa. So it's really a, a fabulous, fabulous program. And, and Steve has had the opportunity to document some of those right. um, translocations of, of lions and rhinos and, and other animals that are being repopulated into landscapes that, you know, they've been completely poached out of and they're well protected and thriving. Now, um, on the last tiger story I did for the magazine and the tiger book that Sharon and I did, Tigers Forever, I worked, worked on the two subspecies of tiger that had never been covered before, the Sumatran tiger and the Indo-Chinese tiger in Thailand. And with working on the Indo-Chinese tiger, I'm going to turn it over to Sharon so she can talk about a project that we worked on that led to our last story in National Geographic. And for the record, he spent a lot of time in India and covered the Bengal tiger too. Well, um, yes, but, it's the um, only place you can see tigers. We know so that. when Steve was working on that tiger story, um, he heard about a place called the Thai Tiger Temple that um, he didn't have time to really spend um, you know, investigating. However, um, a couple of years later, we got some information from a woman who had been following the Tiger Temple for years, um, that she believed that if we worked closely, we could prove that this, um, this tiger venue, which was both a Buddhist monastery that doubled as a tiger uh, tourism venue where you could you know, pet and bottle feed cubs um, and take selfies and, and, and walk with adult tigers. Um, and, and have contact with adult tigers. Um, we spent a year, um, a woman named Sybil P Foxcroft, worked very closely right. with Steve and I. And, um, Mostly with you. And uh, after a year, we were able to prove that they were not only speed mass breeding tigers at the Tiger Temple, but um, they were also shipping those tigers into the illegal wildlife trade in Asia. Um, Within four months, um, the venue was closed down. And because you wrote four incredible stories and never gave up. Um, which That is, gave the Thai government the information that they needed to influence the people in power. And they went in and removed the tigers and closed the place 178 down. tigers. Right. So yes, Steve and I you know, published... Um, you know, a series of stories, you know, with National Geographic, and it, it had global impact, which was fabulous. Um, not long after that, um, I found out that there are somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 captive tigers here in the United States, and that um, they're so loosely regulated that that's a pretty broad estimate and that they too were being used for tiger tourism in much the same way as, as the Tiger Temple. Um, we wanted to find out what happens to them once they get too big and dangerous to pet, which is at about 12 to 14 weeks. So, you know, these venues require a constant supply of new cubs. So Steve and I spent almost three years, um, Off and on, yeah. um, some of it undercover, uh, investigating you know, tigers in the United States, and we did uncover um, animal abuse, widespread, um, illegal wildlife trafficking, and a range of other criminal activity. Um, since the story came out, uh, it was published in the December issue, um, December 2019 issue of National Geographic Magazine. Um, there has been much greater support in Congress for a new bill that would finally introduce federal um, legislation on big cat ownership and hands-on contact with big cats. It's called the Big Cat Public Safety Act, and um, you know recognizes um, you know serious public safety issues uh, in terms of you know these venues. And you know I think one of the really important facts that the public needs to know is that in uh, any kind of tourism attraction that allows hands-on contact with wildlife um, has some kind of dark underbelly. There's, there's abuse, there's illegal trade, there's some kind of criminal activity. 
So, you know, that's a really important uh, rule of thumb. Um, is there anything else about that story that we should share? Yeah, well, oh, well what about the, the, the Sides yes. part? Uh, well, um, uh, two things. Um, everyone, it goes beyond every this. one of these wildlife tourism venues that we visited here in the U.S. all claim to um, promote conservation, and, and they tell visitors that by visiting there, they are supporting conservation, and it's just simply not true. No, not one captive bred tiger has ever been successfully released into the wild because once tigers are habituated to humans, they're drawn to human settlements. They kill livestock, which are people's livelihood, and endanger people Human and their families. Life, um, yeah. And also, you know, these, these um, captive bred tigers are inbred, crossbred, uh, unhealthy tigers. So even if tigers ever could be reintroduced back into the wild, it certainly wouldn't be these animals. So um, it's very interesting the way, you know, some of our work evolved to also look at the, um, the nexus between, you know, captive wildlife and, um, and, and the impacts, you know, in the wild. I, I think the story about the sightings being is very important also because, uh, you know, um, after the ivory ban during the CITES meeting, one of the men from U.S. Fish and Wildlife asked his Chinese counterpart if they could talk about tigers. And yeah. the man from the Chinese government just laughed and said, at least we know how many tigers we have. So part of our hope, because you always hope that in the end these stories are gonna do something, it's educating the re readers and the public, but maybe do something broader that we can help give enough information with Sharon's writing. It was a 30 page story. And some of my images that will make a larger difference for the future of tigers. Um, I think the, you know, the broader reason that we did the US tiger story was because um, you know, in many instances, the United States has had a strong vo voice for wildlife conservation. Um, certainly the bilateral ivory ban that was negotiated with China, a uh, domestic uh, sale ban. Um, but, you know, China, Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam all farm tigers for the trade in tiger skins, tiger bone wine, other tiger products. Uh, many of which are bought as luxury products. Um, and as long as um, the situation is so unregulated and out of control here in the US, it gives those countries cover for violating a decision, you know, by an international treaty, CITES, that tigers should not be formed for their parts and products. So, you know, if, if legislation does indeed move forward here in the US, then perhaps it can make a difference in China. It, so, it, it already has more sponsors than it needs in the house. So to wrap comes. things up a little bit, here we are. With science-based policies in place, strong enforcement and an educated and involved public, the illegal and unsustainable trade in wildlife should prevent further extinctions and will allow endangered species to recover. It will also help us save ourselves. Our well-being is interwoven with the entire web of life. Human health, animal health, and ecosystem health are inextricably linked, and protecting nature protects humanity. One could say that the state of the world can be measured by the state of the wild. This current pandemic is a clarion call that we need to do a better job of protecting life on earth, our only home. Stopping global wildlife trade is critical. It will restore ecosystems that provide fresh water for billions of people and mitigate against climate change by providing a buffer from flooding and sequestering carbon. And keeping ecosystems intact will prevent the next pandemic was with is just a plain flight away. I love that part. You could argue that the state of the world 
can be measured by the state of the wild. Thanks to Sanctuary Asia, and thank you so much to book my show. The Sikh Sanctuary Project is going to influence so many people. Thank you so much for the opportunity we've had tonight. Thank you so much, and please, you know, be safe and be well, and um, let's try to move forward as we emerge from, you know, isolation at whatever point this pandemic becomes manageable, um, to think about the planet in another way. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bitu. Bye, everybody.